Let's talk about the real estate sector. And uh, Ben Woodhams is the managing director of Night Frank Kenya. Uh, ben is in the studio. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Kenya's biggest conversation. Thank you very much. It's good to have you here with us. It's very nice to be here. Um, you know, you, you came in and asked, what time do you guys get here? So <laughs> with the conversation that City is trying to bring up, oh, you know, people should be living early, oh, this and the other. What time did you <laughs> get on the road <laughs> to get here at 6.30? <laughs> To be honest, for me, it was very easy. I came from Karen straight down the southern bypass. So it took me 20 minutes, but it was an early start. So I was here at half past six. So mm. it's not too bad, actually. Wasn't bad at that point. No. See? Mm. See? Yeah, live early. Start mm. early, you yeah. get here early. Okay. Yeah. Does it kill you to get to the office early? No. Mm. So you want to leave at seven and you think you're going to get to the office at eight. Get to the office at 10. Mm. My point exactly. People from Kitengela who are listening to you in traffic this morning, <laughs> mm. Wish they had a they'd stone seat. you because they tell you what time they leave home. And that would change the flow of traffic if they stoned me, of course. Yes, <laughs> because you're completely out of touch with their reality. People leave home at 5, 5.30 and they get to town at 7.38, depending on some small thing that has happened in, in between. I don't know, CRB, CCCCCCCCC, which is doing the expressway, has mm -hmm. decided to put a new, to sink a new sinkhole in the middle of the road. Or oh, like today when they decided they're going to close off part of the overhead bridge, which is essentially let you go to town. See? So. But Does this happen every day? No, it doesn't. Mm. So you can't predict. Mm. So if you left at three <laughs> like yesterday. <laughs> three and the road is closed. <laughs> You really want to win this argument, don't uh, you? You have won. Okay, you have won. Bas. I am mistaken. I misunderstand the whole thing. Those who are listening to me, forgive me. I have spoken out of turn. Please enjoy the traffic jams. <laughs> <laughs> ben, tell us about Knight Frank. Who's Knight and who's Frank? Knight <laughs> <laughs> uh, Frank is, is a very old company. It's about 125, 130 years old. Uh, for, it was formed in the UK. And it was originally called Knight, Frank and Rutley, I guess, after the three gentlemen that founded the company. Uh, and about 30 years ago, they dropped the Rutley to make it sound a bit less like a provincial firm of uh, lawyers mm -hmm. and more slick and, and modern. And I guess seeing as the guy was dead anyway, he didn't really mind. So that's that's Knight, Frank. Yeah, it's a real estate consultancy um, headquartered in the UK, but but all over the world. Mm -hmm. Over 6000 employees scattered all, all over. What do you do? What do I do? No, what does Knight Frank do? Oh, I see. Yes, so Knight Frank is a real estate consultancy firm. So basically, they advise clients on how to operate real estate. And that could be from property management to agency, valuation, all aspects of real estate. So you, if you want advice on... I suppose historically would be buying and selling of houses in the UK, but now it's it's much more sophisticated. We could be advising a multinational uh, on how to open their new operation in a, in a country in, in Central Africa. Mm. Uh, and in terms of how much space they would need, uh, which office building to choose, you know, that, that sort of very in-depth consultancy that allows... Uh, organizations to make strategic decisions on their real estate so everything everything you can imagine about real estate is mm. is covered by us okay so i mean obviously having been in operation in the country for 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 some time um what would you describe the kenyan landscape as when it comes to real estate in terms of those who may come from an external market to come and do business here or even those who set up businesses uh, locally, mm. how would you describe the landscape? So I came to Kenya in 2003 for Night Frank. Prior to that, I was running their operation in Tanzania for four years. So in 2003, you still had to go to Johannesburg from Nairobi if you wanted to get to Central Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, so back in those days, the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa was run out of Johannesburg. And for the next 10 years, from 2003 onwards, I think those big uh, global corporates realized that they actually needed a regional headquarters to service East Africa. And, and that was Nairobi. Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, in a sense, I was extremely fortunate because I came to Kenya at a time when Nairobi was really coming into its own as a regional hub mm -hmm. uh, and, and was growing from strength to strength. I mean, normal property cycles, you'd, you'd expect them to go up and down over seven years. But, but from 2003 to, say, 2017, Nairobi just grew and grew and grew. And all those regional headquarters were coming here, establishing their big offices. And that was just driving the real estate market here on and on. So if you were to describe Kenya, you would say, well, when you talk about Kenyan real estate, you know, forgive me, you do end up talking about Nairobi specifically. Mm -hmm. And Nairobi is is much, much bigger than uh, the capital cities in the region, the other capital cities. And it's also much bigger than you would expect it to be than the secondary cities within Kenya itself. Mm -hmm. So Nairobi is is inflated by this regional role that it plays mm -hmm. over and above its role as a capital city. Mm -hmm. So as far as I've been concerned, as far as Knight Frank's been concerned, you know, we, we were very fortunate that we were here at that time when Nairobi was really growing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's, you know, that's how I would describe it. In this very vast and diversified business of real estate, would you say that uh, Knight Frank has a specific niche, a speciality? I, I think in a sense, yes, but you know, the way I've just described the, the company itself, I mean, running that company is like running uh, a bunch of little companies because each of those service lines are, are quite different in a sense. Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're, if you have um, a valuer or, or, or a residential broker, you know, those are two very different personalities. They do two very different roles. So, so in, a, in a sense, we are quite broad, but yes, we are. We are niche as well in that we operate at, at the higher end of the market because we're, we're not many. We have about 135 people in our organization now. And, and whilst that sounds a lot, it, it, it's really not in terms of covering ground. So if you, if you want to, you imagine the briefcase agents who are operating with their mobile phone and, and their um, literally a briefcase exactly yeah. yes. yes you know there, there are thousands of them and they each of them have their own little patch that they operate in we can't compete with that level and and so what we tend to do is we tend to focus on on the higher end properties particularly in residential but also you know we, we're managing shopping centers we're managing office buildings so so we tend to focus on, on that higher where the margins are higher mm -hmm. uh, and we can't play that volumes game because we're simply not big enough mm -hmm. so i suppose our niche would be to operate at the higher end of the market hmm. You talk about a time where obviously things were booming and there was a flourish in Nairobi between the years of 2012, 2013 to 2017. It was 2003. Sorry, 2003 to 2017. 14 years when things really looked good. Why stop at 2017? Did something now start happening? And then part yeah. two of that question. <laughs> sorry. Don't worry, I'll wait. <laughs> uh, there was this word that was used to describe the real estate markets at that time and even really until about 2019 was that it was a bubble that there was this bubble that people were enjoying living in for the longest time and that all we needed was time for this bubble to burst. Further to that, many would argue that COVID burst the real estate bubble. So what happened in 2017 that would make things kind of change? And then did the real estate bubble in the country burst? Okay. Um, thanks for limiting that to two questions because I don't think I would have remembered many more. <laughs> I was thinking about the third one, but I said, okay, let me give you a minute. <laughs> so, yeah, the first question, I, I think really what happened is we went, the market went into oversupply. Mm. It, it, it got, and, and this is normal. This is why I talk about a seven year cycle in the property market. Mm. I think if you went back seven years previously, you probably would have seen the same thing if you looked at the data carefully enough, but it was completely masked by the general economic growth. Uh, in, in 2017, we had, we had too much retail for mm. sure. We had, in fact, it was starting earlier. It probably start, I think 2015 was probably our last really good year. 2016, we started seeing things slow down. In 2017, we, we had overstretched ourselves and we were seeing, you know, things, things pulling back quite dramatically. And, and I think I would just put that down to oversupply. Mm -hmm. I, I think the market got too heated. We saw a general economic slowdown. And, you know, when, when supply exceeds demand, price falls. And, uh, you know, it's basic, um, you know, 101 economics. Mm -hmm. And, and that's really what happened. Now, uh, moving on to the question about, about the bubble, I, I actually get asked this question about bursting bubble quite a lot. And, um, and uh, yeah, the, the simple answer is no. 
there never has been a bubble to burst in Kenya. And the, the reason is primarily because you have to have certain ingredients in place for, for a bubble to burst. What we've seen is a, is a price correction. So in other words, you know, supply exceeds demand. And so price drops to the point where the market sorts itself out. Now, that can be a bursting bubble in certain markets. So if you go back to the global financial crisis of 2007 in the, in the United States, mm -hmm. with uh, the, um, it started with um, the, Lehman Brothers. The, 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 the lending that, that was going on in the mortgage sector. If you imagine three people uh, who have houses, identical houses next to each other, hypothetically, so the guy in house one has got a 50% a mortgage. Mm -hmm. The guy in house two doesn't have a mortgage at all. And the guy in house three has a 50% mortgage. Now you have, you have uh, a shock in the market whereby uh, people suddenly can't afford to, to repay their mortgages. And so the banks foreclose. Mm -hmm. What are the banks interested in doing? They're interested in getting their money back. Sure. Mm -hmm. So what, do you get, what are they going to sell house A and house C for? 50%. Yep. They want their money and they, they want to just want their money back. and move. So house A sells for 50%. House C sells for 50%. Now, what do you think house B is worth? 50%. 50%. The guy's done nothing wrong. And he had no mortgage. No mortgage. Suddenly, 50% of his property value is gone. Mm. And that's what happened when the bubble burst in the States. You had the ingredients where you had a huge amount of lending. Mm -hmm. Much of it was inappropriate lending to people who couldn't really afford it at inflated levels. And, and the whole thing was shut down by the banks overnight. Mm -hmm. And so you had this bubble literally burst. Mm -hmm. right? Now, why I don't believe that can happen in Kenya is because, A, we haven't got a situation where huge amounts of people are, are losing their jobs. Mm -hmm. But B, more importantly, there's very, very little lending. Mm. in Kenya. Mm. There's less than 30,000 mortgages. Mm. So, so, so that market almost doesn't exist. I mean, that is so small in a population of, what are we now, 45 million people. Mm. It is absolutely tiny. So, so you can't have that level of shock, that sudden deflation mm. of that bursting bubble. All you can have is a price correction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if, if there's an, a, an overstretch in the market, the price will come down and come down and come down until the market tolerates it again. But it's not a collapse. Mm. It's an adjustment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we've seen so far. So would you then say, given what you've just said, that real estate and all, with all its vagaries are perhaps a pointer to the state of a country's economy? Well, I think definitely it's, it's a barometer to, to economic health. And I think it's probably an early indicator as well, because you can see some signs. I mean, one of, one of the great barometers to economic recovery is, is cement production and cement consumption. <laughs> because, you know, once your cement consumption starts going up, you know that the guys who are the decision makers, the early decision makers, have made their decisions and things are starting to move. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think I think that is one of the economic trackers that we look at mm -hmm. uh, is, is cement production and consumption. Obviously, it's slightly distorted by the massive amount of infrastructure that we're seeing in, mm -hmm. in Nairobi at the moment. But but again, that's an economic indicator as well. Ben, we saw many. I mean, I, I, we had conversations about this where we saw very many property owners within the city, especially during the times of COVID. Now, tell us if you think that it would be wrapped up to COVID, whereby spaces were empty, lots were empty mm. because people could not take up those, uh, whether they were rents or whatever they were, uh, buying those pieces. We saw people come and say, pay every month and this property essentially at the end of time becomes yours. We saw people almost giving away three months free, kind of a moratorium on payment uh, until you can get on your feet and pay. We have buildings today that were built and they've, they're till now unoccupied. So what kind of hit did the industry take? And it seemed really severe. I mean, you can imagine somebody who took a mortgage to buy a building and then you have nobody to rent it. What kind of hits were we seeing? Yeah, I, I think I think what you're saying is true, definitely. But but I mean, you know, if you look at the effects of COVID, you know, they 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 were certainly unusual. Uh, a lot of the vacancy that we've seen around is is a delay in decision making uh, that that has subsequently been made. If if you look at the the um, office sector, for example. Mm. You know, a lot of the vacancy that we saw during COVID was simply people working from home. So the properties that we were managing, we were seeing very, very low occupancy rates, but the tenants were still paying rent mm -hmm. uh, because although their staff were working from home, 
uh, you know, the lease is still running on the building and so on and so forth. Now we've started to see those people return. On the residential side, sure, there are situations and you can see them um, driving around Nairobi. You can see there's definitely been a slowdown. There's definitely higher levels of vacancy and there are opportunities for people to come into a market at, at, at a very low point, which, you know, some people will see as an opportunity to move in. There will be some victims for sure. There will be some, uh, um, you know, a separation of the... Um, the men from the boys, as it were, mm. in terms of those developers who perhaps shouldn't really have been in the in the game or don't have the financial muscle to ride that storm. Those whose margins were too small, hadn't built in enough of a buffer. Uh, and, and as I say, there will be some opportunities. But but by and large, you know, we're, we're not seeing a, a huge collapse in that sector. Mm. Explain something, Ben. Um, this period of 2003 to, let's say, 2015, the glory days of Kenya's real estate sector and also would be the same uh, description if it came to the financial sector. It's the glory days of Kenya's financial sector. Banks were growing, their capitalization, their, their deposits were growing, their lending was also higher. But if you look at lending into the real estate sector, maybe they were lending the developers, but they were not lending the buyers. Why is it that we had such a growth in the real estate sector, in commercial and residential and people buying, but not such a huge growth or corresponding growth in the number of mortgages? That's a, that's a really interesting question. I, I think w one of the problems is that, I mean, interestingly, one of the uh, factors of this economy is, is the, the openness of the economy. So the fact that I can borrow in dollars, for example, so if I'm, if I'm developing an office building, I can go to the bank and say, right, I'm going to match my loan repayments to my income. So I'm going to charge my tenants in dollars. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, my whole development is going to be dollar dominated. So instead of borrowing in shillings at, at 12, 14%, I can borrow in dollars at 6%. And so, so that fact, the fact that developers were able to do that meant that quite a lot of the um, commercial property, offices in particular, but also retail, were dollar denominated. Mm. Uh, and in a sense, so, so that, that halved the borrowing cost. Now, obviously, you can't do that if you're an employee because you don't earn in dollars, you earn in shillings. Mm -hmm. But if I'm in uh, a, 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 the commercial sector, you know, I might have uh, an NGO or an embassy in my building, or, or I might simply charge my tenants in dollars. And then it's up to them to, to find those dollars, to pay their rent. So I think that was one reason. I think the other reason on the other side of the coin is, is that it's just too difficult for an employee to service a mortgage at those kind of, of rates when, you know, so, so if they're paid X and, and they are paying a certain amount in rent to say to them, okay, now you have to pay double that to service a mortgage. People just aren't going to do it. And, and, and I think that's a great shame. I've always felt that there should be more mortgages in, in this country. I mean, you know, perhaps when, when I was in, in my um, mid twenties working in London, I was able to buy a flat in London mm. with a 90% mortgage, interest only payments for 99 years. Whoa. Now think about that. So basically I put down a 10% deposit on a 99 year mortgage. So my, th that's the other thing. The interest rates can be high, but also it depends how long the mortgage is mm. because that's how much you have to repay every month. So the longer the mortgage is, the smaller the amount. Now here you're talking about high interest rates and very short terms, 20, 20 years. years. Mm -hmm. so, so your loan repayments are very high. Yeah. Now, when I bought my property in London, what that meant was I was able to service that mortgage, but I was also able to benefit from the, the general economic growth of London. So as the housing market went up by 10%, so my ownership of that property went up by the same amount. Mm. And consequently, my loan to value went down. So, so I was participating in London's growth rather than just paying rent and watching that slip through my fingers. Mm. And it's the same here. You know, I wish more people could participate in the growth of Nairobi, Nairobi's economy, but, but so many people can't afford to do that. It's very easy for me to sit in my ivory tower and say, you should all go out and get mortgages. Mm. But I understand the reasons why people don't or can't do that. 
but it's a great shame. If we could extend the term of those loans to get the, the monthly repayments down, and, and, and I'm not an economist, I'm not saying I have the answers to these problems for sure. I'm just a, an estate agent and I'm looking at it from my own perspective. But if we could, and then get the interest rates down, get more people to participate in that growth, then we're seeing that wealth distribution go out there instead of remaining in the hands of the few. Ben, what's the logic behind giving a 99-year mortgage? It's basically a bank making money out of me. Precisely. Because so, I'm paying the interest <laughs> mm. and yes. I'm never paying the principal back. So when I sell the property, the bank gets the principal back. But in the meantime, You're just it's, paying interest. it's paying interest. So effectively, I'm paying rent but to the bank. But the crucial difference is any growth in the value of that property is mine, not the bank's. Let me ask the question differently. Uh, I'm a bit worried I'm walking myself into a corner. <laughs> <here>. <laughs> no, no, no. No, you're not. I simply want to understand because if you are in your mid-20s and you have a 99-year mortgage, mm. it means for you to complete paying that mortgage... It's a lifetime. To, yes, I, I'm just figuring out <laughs> you, 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 to be 100 and something. Mm. But that's not the point. No Precisely. one would expect you to, to do that. Exactly. They do not. So whatever matrix they use, whatever calculation they use, they figured it out. If you spread this thing adequately, mm. it means whatever mortgage they have given you, they will realize their end of the bargain at a point that they have foreseen. But what they then have done from what you're saying is that they've allowed very many people to be able to access these monies. Mm. Now, here comes my question. You've been here long enough. You understand the banking sector. You work with them. What is so different between the banking sector in the UK and the one in Kenya to the point where the banks in this country cannot offer their citizens something similar? Many of which have bases in the UK. Yes. I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, it's, I guess it's about the maturity of the market. The situation is improving all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there is a more sophisticated uh, market in, in the UK and, and the States and the rest of Europe, I suppose, where, where you know, banks have taken a longer term view. Uh, and, and, you know, they have that activity and they have the breadth of market. I guess it will simply take time to get there. But there's no reason why it couldn't be like that here. Let's take a break on that point. 28 minutes to 8, Kenya's biggest conversation with us in the studio is the Managing Director of Night from Kenya, Ben Woodhams. We're talking about the real estate sector in this country and how uh, it's been growing and how it is recovering from the shocks of COVID-19. Well, Kenya's real estate sector had started experiencing some shocks even before. COVID-19 and that's what we're also discussing what is happening and what's the future of the real estate sector this is the situation room it continues CT Muga Nduoko Eric Latif and Ben Woodhams the managing director of Night Frank Kenya we are talking about the real estate sector in this country during and post COVID-19 so Ben uh, you had said earlier what, what we saw during the at the height of COVID and this is in 2020-2021 where you know very many offices were vacant very many homes people had developed and were not takers what exactly what kind of impact did that really have on the economy i think you know as as the 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 manager of a business you know from my perspective i'm sure it was the same for for a lot of people who who were looking after the welfare of their businesses. I mean, when in March 2020, when we suddenly realized this was something coming that was big, uh, you know, we were all very frightened of it. We didn't know what to expect. But what we did know was that our turnover was going to drop dramatically. So I think the first thing we did was, was we ensured the health and well-being of our staff. That was priority number one. So we needed to make sure that, that they, were, they were safe, they were protected. If they needed to come to work, they would do so in a way that wouldn't put them into any danger. So once we got the, the health and well-being of our staff sorted, we then had to focus on that of the business. And so we made huge cost cuttings. The only way we could protect ourselves from a dramatic drop in turnover was to really slash every single cost that we possibly could. So all the training went out the window, all the travel went out the window, absolutely everything we could. We, um, we had salary cuts across the board with management taking 20 down to 5% for the messengers uh, and, and, you know, everything. And so in the end, 2020 actually wasn't that bad a year and and because we'd hit the cost so hard uh, we were actually able to give that uh, salary 
uh, reduction back to the staff at the end of the year. And, and uh, paradoxically, although we started to see a recovery in 21, that was a harder year financially for us because all those costs started to come back in again. Mm. Uh, and yet we, the turnover hadn't recovered, mm. really. It was taking much longer to recover than we thought it would. So it, in fact, when we look at our audited accounts for 2021, our financial position is worse than it was of those for 2020. And I think a lot of businesses uh, suffered the same thing. So, um, you know, we're still coming out of it. It's, it's, it's going to take a little while. 2022 is looking much more positive, And I can talk about that in more detail. But certainly, you know, even with the specter of the, you know, the storm clouds of the general election over the horizon, uh, we, we foresee 2022 to be a year of recovery. Do you have statistical data to support what you've just said? Well, as a matter of fact, I do, um, but <laughs> but but I think you know, l looking at it from from Knight Frank's perspective, I mean, you know, if we we said you know, if we're looking at it sector by sector, so retail, the shopping centre, we've seen rents increase by two and a half percent for the second half of twenty twenty one. So so again, you know, a, a small but early sign of recovery. Office rents uh, rose seven percent in twenty twenty one. On, uh, on 2020. Absorption of offices went up by 126% in 2021. So what that means is this empty space that you were talking about mm. um, Duo, was um, really now beginning to be absorbed in 2021. 2020, there was no decisions being made anywhere. Nobody knew what was going on. And so the, the management response was, let's defer any str strategic decision making. Yeah. So, so really, we had this hiatus of nothing, nothing really happening. Um, and then and then, you know, during 2021, we've, we've started to see. So occupancy in our AB, so that's the top two layers of, of office space, uh, as was risen to 78 percent. In, in 2020, uh, which is much, uh, sorry, in, in 2021, much mm. higher than in 2020, it was around 60%. But putting that into perspective, it was 90% in 2016. So it was still a long way to go before, you know, we get back to those, those glory days, which we speak of. Mm. Uh, in hospitality, arrivals, foreign tourists coming into Kenya was 0.57 million in 2020. Not surprisingly, that went up to 0.87 million in 2021. So hospitality, I mean, it's an interesting one. That sector relies on uh, the external market for tourists, but also the internal market for conferences mm. and, and all of that business stuff as well. So in, in a sense, again, Nairobi benefiting from being a regional hub has two bites at that cherry. But uh, uh, both of those were very badly hit during uh, COVID. The alternative sectors, this is the really interesting side. So, you know, your traditional asset classes where people are investing in residential uh, retail, shopping centers, offices, they're now starting to look into different sectors. So we're talking about data centers, logistics, light industrial, healthcare, senior housing, student accommodation. These are sectors now that people are, are seeing opportunities here with Kenya's young, growing population, mm. very well educated, uh, very high uh, occupancy of uh, universities. So student accommodation, uh, data centers, legislation has changed so that uh, banks and insurance companies have to have the data for their clients within the country. So, I mean, you know, the Internet is the World Wide Web. It's global. Mm -hmm. uh, you can actually, you know, the, the data that you have on your phone, it, it could be in Greenland. It could be anywhere. Mm -hmm. But the legislation says for the banking sector, the financial sector, their data must be within Kenya. And so this is this has led to, you know, a mushrooming of of uh, of the data center sector. So, you know, all of these new opportunities that are arising as a result of um various changes that have happened in the market. There obviously was a slowdown in um, very many of the multinationals that were looking to come and establish presence in Kenya, making Nairobi their hub for, yeah. for the region or just for the country. Many of them that had maybe uh, started plans to open up offices or to increase their presence in the country had to take a slowdown on those decisions or even shelve some of those decisions. Are they coming back? Are they deciding, okay, yeah, we wanted to come into the country, into the region in uh, 2019, 2020, 2021. Are they now revisiting those decisions? In a big way. In a really big way. Mm -hmm. the, the level of interest we are seeing in, in just the office sector alone, I think is unprecedented. 
I mean, the, the, the hiatus that I've talked about holding back, particularly in the, the IT sector, the fintech sector, uh, huge. And, and not just looking for office space, but looking for staff as well. You know, these, these big um, um, global IT corporates are, are hoovering up staff. And, and I think, you know, that'll do two things. That, that'll drive the job market. But it'll, I think it'll also drive Kenyans back into Kenya from the diaspora as well. And I would love to see that happen mm. uh, because, you know, there are so many Kenyans out there who could come back here and help build this economy. And I think that's going to start happening. Yeah. Brings in another angle to the conversation, which is the mushrooming of the co-working spaces. Many of them that have, you know, set up various workable, Kofisi, mm. um, Ikigai and the others. Mm. Tell us about this sector. Okay, that's a really interesting story. I'm glad you asked me that question because those guys were hit really hard at the beginning of the pandemic. Because, you know, if I'm in an office lease, I have a six year lease. As, as a company. Mm. And so it doesn't matter if my staff will go home. I still have to pay my rent. Yeah. But the serviced office sector is not the same. You can terminate that, you know, that you have that flexibility. So you might have two weeks notice. So those guys, their business collapsed mm. overnight. I mean, there was literally nothing. Everyone went home. No, thank you. I work from home. I'm not interested in your serviced offices. And so they really struggled. Now the shoe is on the other foot. Everybody wants that flexibility. Mm. They want to be able to work when they want to work mm. from home, in the office, whatever. And so those guys are really driving the office sector now and, and they are doing f phenomenally well. W one of the ones in the list that you just mentioned has taken uh, the biggest amount of office space that we have let since the oil boom days. Uh, back in wow. 2015 wow. Mm. so we're, we're really seeing that sector grow but but that's just just one example i think they they were the first guys to to make that commitment now we're seeing the big global corporates coming piling in after them as well and so any excess space that we have in grade a is, is going now I'll, I'll preempt a question that you ask me i mean a lot of people say is the office market dead everyone's now working from home we don't need offices anymore and my answer to that is no definitely on lease renewal i mean we we manage over 7 million square feet of commercial property. So we have a really good idea of what's going on in the market. Lease renewal, there are a number of organizations that want a bit less space when they renew their lease mm -hmm. because of this factor. Some mm -hmm. of their staff are working from home when we're allowed to, and we're not worried about touching each other, as it were. Sorry, sure. not, not like that. Mm. <laughs> um, Got it. We'll, uh, <laughs> we can hot desk. Yeah. We can share workstations. Mm. You know, I'm going to use this desk Monday and Friday. You're going to use it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yep. Uh, and so on and so forth. And mm. so there will be a reduction in space. But conversely, these guys who are coming in and setting up the work environment and want to attract the best talent, they actually want quite a lot of space. Mm. They've got breakout space. They've got a lot of space between their staff. You know, they're spending, in some cases, the fit out is more than the cost of the construction of the building itself. Wow. Mm. And they're just tenants. So they are doing that to attract the best talent. Mm -hmm. So no, the office market is not dead. It's being used differently for sure, but it is not dead. It's still a very important part of this economy. Mm. Do you, see, I mean, obviously you talked about 2022 and then going forward being a better, a better year. Yeah. These are some of the factors, obviously, I mean, I'm just going to assume that some of the factors that would then indicate that, you know, potential growth. Where do you see some of the other growth coming from? Well, I mean, this is the alternative sectors that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So so data centers, definitely uh, logistics, light industrial. I mean, if you look at logistics in the first world, it absolutely took off during COVID because mm -hmm. everybody was buying online. Nobody wanted to go shopping. They wanted stuff delivered to their home. So the likes of Amazon, mm -hmm. you know, huge. Now in, in Africa, we don't really have the last mile delivery. Mm -hmm. there, there's a there's a gap in that chain. Okay, we have the border borders, but it's not really the same thing. So we didn't see that explosion. However, um, that sector still did did very well here. But I, th I think for me, healthcare, senior housing, uh, assisted living, uh, and student accommodation, those those are the sectors that, that are really going to be driven here. Data centers as well, mm. as I said, for those reasons of um, change in legislation and change in working habits. I mean, people working from home are driving the demand for internet connectivity in places where they haven't really needed it that mm. much before. So, again, that sector. You've talked about something quite interesting, assisted living. Tell us a bit about that. Okay, so it's not, I don't think it's really very... Uh, uh, typical in African culture, mm. but but in in uh, some parts of the world, your um, 
ra- your your the elderly uh, are are assisted in in how they live. So they will have their own home, but they will um, be able to call medical assistance if they wish. They'll have extra services um, uh, provided for them. So it's not it's not like a, a full nursing home or a care home. It's a place where someone who who would perhaps normally rely on on their children to look after them or or their their extended family can, can actually move into uh, a, a community, community whereby you know they are of a similar age you know they there is socializing set up for them and they're they're assisted so they can they can almost live you know uh, uh, the normal life that they would but they mm-hmm. have the help to be able to to enable them to do that mm. so just like serviced accommodation yeah for for the elderly the elderly exactly You're yeah. living in this community mm. and they th- there's doctors will come and see you nurses will come and see mm-hmm. you and you've got help help helping you around mm-hmm. are you saying that is growing in Kenya yes really <laughs> I mean it's still quite small mm. but but yeah and I think we will see it grow I mean it's it, you know it's a cultural shift mm-hmm. it's not for everybody uh, but uh, you know there are c- certain circumstances where where it works and you know those that that have been developed here uh, have been have proved to be very popular hmm. so i think we will we might see that grow even more i'm not saying that's going to be a big driver of mm. of the economy or the real estate sector but it's certainly a sector that people are looking at right there's a sector in the real estate market that uh, you stated categorically isn't your niche low cost housing Right. Now, this is a sector where the vast majority of Kenyans would perhaps find suitable for them or affordable for them. Indeed. But since it's real estate, I'm mm. sure you know something about it. Well, I think the big four agenda, if I'm not mistaken, was half a million units. Um, I think we're, you know, we're getting there. We're a long way to go. We are actually involved in uh, low cost housing, but not 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 on the actual day to day selling of the properties themselves. So, you know, if you're talking to an organization who wants to develop in that field, we might help them find a site to do so. Uh, and, you know, that, so, so being involved in that kind of level. But what tends to happen with, with low cost housing is uh, a, a cluster will be developed and then there'll be a show house on that site. And the, the developer's own staff will actually do that selling the marketing and so on and so forth. Mm. But, uh, well, let me ask the question I actually want to ask. Do we actually have low cost housing developments in this country? I okay. As far as a developer is concerned, low low cost housing is is difficult because there's no profit in it. There's no profit margin. So essentially it's like a social service. In a way, yes, but there are there are there are ways the government can build that profitability back into that development. Mm. and there are various ways of doing that but but i think government always has to be involved so it may be that government gives the land it may be that government guarantees take off it may be that government puts tax incentives in there mm. but a a residential developer needs to make about a 20% margin uh, in order for his business to work so if the if his low cost housing scheme doesn't have that 20% margin it has to be built into it mm. and so that's normally what happens in in is, is that government will artificially create that 20% margin through through the various ways that I've mentioned. In the example you gave I me mean, about what you did in London years ago um and then talking about you know you'd love to see I mean I think I think many would love to see then Kenyans be able to compete mm. or at least to contribute to mm. the growth of cities for mm. example and you know there's so many participate. factors participate right yeah. uh there's so many factors that stop that from being mm. a reality in mm. Kenya today. Mm. However there's an understanding from several players in the sector mm. such as yourselves mm. in terms of what could happen mm. imagining what could happen do you think there's room for private sector and government to work together to realize some of these things i think there is definitely i mean one of the things that that i didn't mention when when um ct asked me you know wh- why the differences are is you know one of the legislations um that you face in in those parts of the world where this works is if you don't repay you lose your property very fast yes 
-hmm. And, you know, if I didn't keep up my mortgages, that, that mortgage house would, would repossess and has the power and the legislation to do that very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for them, very easily. That doesn't exist here. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for a financial institution to foreclose and to sell. I think it's getting easier, but, but I think that's probably one of the biggest barriers mm -hmm. is the difficulty that it is to, to actually throw somebody out of their home mm -hmm. and recover the property. And, and, and th although that legislation is there to protect the homeowner, mm. and it does, it also prevents the homeowner, really, in the grand scheme of things, to be able to borrow to buy a home. Mm. So it has an, a, a reverse effect as well. Indeed, yes. But I was coming to address something, though, where, where banks would just look at you and blink twice, <laughs> and they've taken your house. <laughs> I mean, there are very many people who, the few who had mortgages or the few who had borrowed at that point, you know, when it was still less than 10,000 10, mortgages in the country and the complaint was that it was, I mean, you basically just don't meet your obligation in this month and the next month the bank has come and your house is up for auction. You know, as we're talking about this, um, mm. I remember development that began in the 1970s and continued for a long time. It was in five phases, a mm. development called the Buruburu Estate. Yep. Okay. It was a partnership of the City Council of Nairobi then, the central government, and the British Commonwealth Development uh, Corporation. Mm. Now, it's iconic in the sense that it's one of the biggest developments this country has ever seen, supposedly for middle class. Now, the middle class in this country are not some esoteric, wealthy uh, group of people, if we're to go by the uh, Kenya Bureau of Statistics uh, uh, data. But it worked. Ordinary working class people could actually put a deposit and buy and pay over time. But as you correctly put it, Ben, the government had to be involved. It worked. Other efforts that are supposed to be part of the Big Four agenda, most of them are limping. They, 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 there's a clear effort, there's some direction to it, but it isn't quite there. Now, why am I belaboring this point? It's because I would have assumed that a market that one wants to work around and figure ways of servicing is a market that has a large number of people. Because even if you look at the vagaries of problems that come about with such financing, there's a safety net because the numbers are huge. The economies of scale will work in your favor. But this isn't a market. Beyond private investors uh, getting involved in it, we don't see other people being involved. Why would you say this is? Yeah, I mean, it's... It is a difficult one. There are there are obstacles in in the way, certainly, um, and there are you know easier options out there for for investors, and I, I think that's probably the answer. <laughs> you, you put it so simply and so well. <laughs> this is circuitous and difficult. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Point will take it. There are other other options. Simpler. Yep, easier, easier options. <laughs> ben, we thank you very much for joining us today. Not at all. It's been a pleasure. Ben Woodhams is an MD. Night Frank Kenya. We've been talking about the real estate sector in the country. A good job that um, you're doing, and also it's it's good to see someone who's saying, "Well, there's some positivity. L just look at it. Things are gonna get better yeah. and easier." <laughs> we don't get very many people who are optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, certainly, I'm certainly not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> see, see what I mean. <laughs>